Elephantine Island in the Nile marked the border between Egypt and Nubia and was a place of great sanctity in ancient times. Among the travelers who came here were the earliest European historians, the Greeks, men like Herodotus, brought up as he was in the classical tradition which regarded the various races of the known world as different but equal. The Greeks knew Egypt well and firmly believed that the original Egyptians were black people who had come from the south to settle the land of the Nile. But Herodotus himself got no further than this. He was prevented by the first cataract from traveling further south. And so he never saw the huge temple which Ramesses II chose to build here at Abu Simbel, further south into inner Africa than any other great monument built by the pharaohs to celebrate their power. A few years ago, with immense ingenuity, the entire structure was lifted to a new site, above the artificial lake which has drowned all the sites of the most ancient kingdoms that flourished here in Nubia, even before the first of the pharaohs. But why should he have built this great temple so far to the south? Perhaps because his queen, Nefertari, was herself a Nubian. And also because these were the people, the people of the south, whom he wanted to impress with evidence of the prisoners he'd taken in faraway Syria and Asia Minor. Even mighty temples like this one have to be seen against the background origins of ancient Egyptian civilization. And those origins, in the light of modern science, were above all African. No matter what ideas or customs the pharaohs may have found in the Asian lands they conquered, Egypt's beginnings were in the south, in this inner Africa which the ancient Egyptians called the land of the gods, of the African gods whom they revered as their guardian spirits. The time came when Egyptian conquests ended. 400 years later it was the turn of the kings of the south of Nubia who now marched north to subdue the power of Egypt itself. And here is the most famous of those mighty kings of the south, recognized by the peoples of that time, the 7th century BC, as among the masters of the world. This one, as it happens, received a favorable mention in the Bible, in the Book of Kings, as the emperor of Kush and of all Egypt, whose name was Taharqa. By 650 BC, the Nubian kings who had subdued Egypt were ready to withdraw to the south, to Napata, and then to a new capital in their kingdom of Kush, at Meroe. And there we must follow them, if we are to understand the history of this inner Africa, which exercised so strong an early influence on ancient Egyptian civilization, and which later was to reflect that influence. The city of Meroe was situated a thousand miles south of the old Egyptian frontier, far into inner Africa. I never come here without a sense of wonder, for right ahead in the midst of this pitiless desert, there stands one of Africa's great historical surprises. remnants of a lost civilization standing across the skyline as though shipwrecked on the sands of time. These are the pyramid tombs of the kings and queens of Meroe who reigned and were buried here through more than six centuries.
Long ruined by tomb robbers and by time, the pyramids are being restored and even reconstructed. Meroitic civilization still presents many puzzles. One is that the monarchs of Kush built their pyramid tombs long after such monuments had ceased to be raised in Egypt. Partly because the pyramids of Meroe are neither as old nor as massive as those of Egypt, it's been assumed that all this was a mere provincial copy of that greater civilization. In fact, it was far more than a copy. The similarities are there, but other aspects of Meroitic culture are found nowhere else. Another intriguing question is the relationship between the ancient people of Meroe, kings, queens and citizens, and the modern Nubians who live in this region today. We can still see their stylized portraits in stone. But what did they really look like? I asked Dr. Ali Osman of the University of Khartoum. Oh, they look like me, of course. I am a Nubian. Uh, um, very much the, the Nubians of today are the Nubians of yesterday. We, we got to understand that rather carefully because the Nubian culture actually have not yet been very much explored. The Nubians from within, I mean, I the Nubian, what I do and how I behave, wouldn't have changed that much from what the medieval Nubians ha have done. But the influence that are coming on us as Nubians, uh, starting as early as you could say the Egyptian, and coming down to the Muslim and Arab influence, have been changing. That does not mean that the Nubians have changed. But this identity has had to survive many foreign incursions and even conquests. At one time, Meroe fell before the invading armies of Aksum, another ancient kingdom high in the mountains of what is now Ethiopia. In more recent times, the Turks and the British have sent in their armies of occupation. Most lasting of all has been the influence of Islam. But through all these changes, the Nubians have done more than retain their identity. Just as they absorbed influences from elsewhere, so they too have had a deep cultural impact on their neighbors. They build now as they've always built, in all probability just as the people of Meroe built, with an old effort-saving rhythm constructing mud walls to defy the scorching heat of the Nubian summer. Their beds are no different from those of their ancient ancestors, like this one in Khartoum Museum, with a pattern of headrest which is much the same here and right across Africa as those of 5,000 years ago. And the traditional clan marks cut into this Nubian's face can be seen exactly reproduced on a stone relief which decorates one of the pyramids just a couple of miles away. It's been said that Meroe was the Birmingham of ancient Africa. And that wasn't altogether a flight of fancy, for the people of Meroe had a very extensive iron-making industry. Just consider this enormous pile of industrial waste, of slag. It proves that among the major activities of the people of this flourishing city was to smelt iron. And here,